on World News Tonight. Nuclear threat. Putin says nuclear risk is rising but they would not use weapons first. State summit. Saudi's MBS rolls out the red carpet to China's Xi in a not too subtle message to Biden. Resident impeached. Peru swears in a new president after Castillo ousted in the impeachment trial. And it's a deco wonderland. Swiss Christmas decoration stores booms as shoppers flock back. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Now, Russian President Vladimir Putin says that the risk of a nuclear war is rising, but stressing that Russia would not use nuclear weapons first, seeing such a measure as a deterrence only. Russian President Vladimir Putin on Wednesday said that the threat of a nuclear war is rising, but insisted Russia had not gone mad and would not use its nuclear weapons first. We haven't gone mad. We understand what nuclear weapons are. We have these means and they are more advanced and modern than in any other nuclear country. This is obvious today. It's a fact. But we are not going to swing it like a razor running around the world. But of course, we proceed from the fact that we have got it. Speaking at Russia's annual Human Rights Council meeting, President Putin stressed that his country would only use weapons of mass destruction in response to an attack. Putin also noted that American nuclear weapons in large numbers are located on European territory and that Russia will defend itself and its allies with all available means, if necessary. He added that while Russia doesn't deploy its nuclear weapons, including tactical nuclear weapons, in other countries, the U.S. on the other hand does, referring to ones in Turkey and in a number of other countries in Europe. Also appearing to recognize that his plan to claim victory within days of invading Ukraine had failed, the Russian president admitted the war could be a lengthy process. However, he noted that there had been significant results for the Russians, referring to the new territories it claimed through its referendums. He also boasted the annexations had made the Sea of Azov, bordered by southeast Ukraine and southwest Russia, an internal sea of Russia, adding that this was an aspiration of Russian Tsar Peter the Great. Chinese President Xi Jinping is in Riyadh for a three-day trip, underscoring the constantly growing importance of Sino-Saudi relations and a clear message from Saudi Arabia that it will not take diktats from the United States. Xi's red carpet welcome is a far cry from President Joe Biden's trip to Riyadh this summer. Xi's first trip to Saudi Arabia in six years gives Saudi Crown Prince and Prime Minister Mohammed bin Salman a greater opportunity to assert his influence on the international stage as an increasingly important figure in global affairs. This week's meeting will mostly focus on the economic dimensions of Sino-Saudi partnership. Saudi and China is to sign agreements worth $29.6 billion. Such agreements will add to trade, business and investment relations between the two countries that have greatly deepened in recent years. Ties between the two countries have grown in recent years to also include massive contracts for Chinese construction companies, widespread adoption of Chinese technology despite security concerns, and even transfer of military hardware like drones and ballistic missiles, as well as help fabricating uranium yellow cake needed for a civil nuclear energy program or a nuclear arms capability. From Beijing's perspective, Saudi Arabia is an extremely important source of energy that greatly matters to the future of China's economic growth. Times Person of the Year was Ukraine's President Zelensky in recognition of his leadership during Russia's war in his country. From the battlefield to the bunker to meeting with heads of state. Over the past 10 months, Volodymyr Zelensky seems to have been everywhere. Since Russia's invasion on February 24th, the Ukrainian president has delivered daily speeches, followed locally and globally. And it's that fighting spirit, along with Zelensky's decision to remain in Kyiv and rally his country, that made him Time magazine's pick for Person of the Year. Time editor-in-chief Edward Felsenthal said this year's decision was the most clear-cut in memory. His information offensive shifted the geopolitical weather system, setting off a wave of action that swept the globe. In choosing Zelensky, the magazine said the Ukrainian president had shown that in resisting the Russian invasion, courage is contagious. 
The former comedian and actor, who once played a president on a TV show, has proven himself to be an expert in the art of social media, as he also fights an ongoing information war. But there have been some perceived missteps along the way. A Vogue cover story with the First Lady was criticized as being out of touch, with some objecting to glossy photo shoots while Ukrainians were suffering the horrors of war. While meetings with celebrities like American actor Ben Stiller have also come under fire. Zelensky, for his part, has shown he knows how to leverage these high-profile visits to drive media coverage and keep the war in Ukraine at the top of the global news agenda. His relentless pursuit of headlines may anger some, but it ensures that Ukraine is rarely ever out of the spotlight and that may end up being Zelensky's biggest victory. Peru's Congress swore in a new president appointing the country's first ever female leader in a day of sweeping political drama that saw the former leader Pedro Castillo ousted in an impeachment trial hours after attempted a last-ditch bid to stay in power by trying to dissolve Congress. Luego, se dará lectura al proyecto de resolución de Peru's Congress voted to oust President Pedro Castillo in an impeachment trial on Wednesday just hours after he plunged the country into a constitutional crisis by attempting to dissolve the legislature by decree. That morning, he announced he would temporarily shut down Congress and call for new elections, sparking allegations of a coup. In response to citizens' demands throughout the length and breadth of the country, we have decided to establish an exceptional government aimed at re-establishing the rule of law and democracy. Ignoring Castillo's attempt, lawmakers moved ahead with the previously planned impeachment trial, with 101 votes in favor of removing him, six against, and 10 abstentions. The result was announced with loud cheers, and the legislature called for Vice President Dina Boluarte to take office, who was later sworn in as interim president. The ex-president has since been detained by police, and accused of the crime of rebellion for breaking the constitutional order according to Peru's public ministry. The prosecutor's office in October filed a constitutional complaint against Castillo for allegedly leading a criminal organization. Castillo has called the allegation slander. The leftist teacher turned president had survived two previous attempts to impeach him since he began his term just over a year ago. But after his announcement that he would dissolve Congress, allies abandoned him and his ministers resigned. After Peruvian lawmakers voted to oust Castillo, demonstrators in the streets of Lima chanted, we did it, we did it. With one protester telling that as long as there's a brave and combative youth, the Peruvians will have a government elected by the people. High-stakes UN biodiversity talks opened in Montreal in what is being billed as the last best chance to save the planet's species and ecosystems from irreversible human destruction. Blocking traffic outside the French Environment Ministry, these activists say the government is giving gifts to lobbyists and polluting industries, just like Santa Claus. Instead, the activists say not enough attention is given to protecting biodiversity, the topic of the UN's COP15 summit that gets underway on Wednesday. I think that these international agreements, even if they don't bring about what we would like exactly, are absolutely necessary. And today, on the issue of biodiversity, just as much as on the issue of climate change, there is a lot of delay. Representatives from more than 190 countries are meeting in Montreal, Canada, tasked with sealing a deal to stop damage to plants, animals and ecosystems. The proposed framework includes the goal of protecting 30% of global land and sea by 2030. Currently, only 17% of land and 10% of marine areas are protected. One major challenge will be coming up with the money to fund the conservation efforts. Last year, a UN report said global annual spending for land conservation would need to triple this decade to about $350 billion by 2030. To realize the 20 goals of the framework, we need sufficient resources and subsidies. We have a gap in our biodiversity governance. The UN Biodiversity Convention doesn't have a great track record. 
Governments agreed to a set of targets back in 2010, but only six of the 20 were partially met by the 2020 deadline. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, shares of the biggest U.S. banks fell sharply a day after a lineup of the country's top bankers said that they were bracing for a worsening economy next year as inflation threatens the spending power of American consumers. Shares of the biggest U.S. banks fell sharply on Wednesday, a day after a lineup of the country's top bankers said they were bracing for a worsening economy next year as inflation threatens the spending power of American consumers. J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon told Tuesday that consumers and companies are in good shape at the moment, but that may not last much longer, adding that a slowing economy and inflation might very well cause a, quote, mild to hard recession. Dimon said excess savings held by consumers from stimulus programs approved by Congress beginning in 2020 may run out sometime in mid-2023. Diamond also said the Federal Reserve may pause for three to six months after aggressively raising interest rates, but that those higher rates may not be sufficient to tame high inflation. Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan told investors at a Goldman Sachs financial conference that the bank's research shows negative growth in the first part of 2023, but that the contraction will be, quote, mild and Goldman Sachs CEO David Solomon said at the same conference that, quote, economic growth is slowing, adding that when he talks to clients, quote, they sound extremely cautious. Meanwhile, some banks, including Goldman and Citigroup, are cutting jobs. On Tuesday, a source told that Morgan Stanley has reduced about 2% of its workforce, affecting about 1,600 positions. The U.S. Supreme Court's conservative majority appear to be ready to limit judicial power to overrule voting policies crafted by state politicians, but might not go as far as Republican North Carolina lawmakers want in a case the liberal justices painted as the threat to American democratic norms. The U.S. Supreme Court held tense arguments Wednesday in a Republican appeal that could transform elections in the United States by giving politicians more power over voting rules and curb the ability of state courts to scrutinize their actions. Republican state lawmakers are appealing a decision by North Carolina's top court to throw out an electoral map as unlawfully biased against Democratic voters. Republicans are asking the Supreme Court, which has a 6-3 conservative majority, to embrace a once-marginal theory called independent state legislature doctrine. Under that doctrine, Republicans claim the U.S. Constitution gives state legislatures, not other entities such as state courts, authority over election rules and district maps. Justice Elena Kagan said it's a theory that has big consequences. It would uh, say that if a legislature engages in the most extreme forms of gerrymandering, um, there is no state constitutional remedy for that, even if the courts think that that's a violation of the Constitution. It would say that legislatures could enact all manner of restrictions on voting, get rid of all kinds <coughs> of voter protections that the state constitution, in fact, prohibits. Uh, it might allow the legislatures to insert themselves, to give themselves a role in the certification of elections and, and, um, uh, and, and, and the way election results are um, calculated. Kagan added that the proposal could get rid of the normal checks and balances at a time, quote, when they are needed most. It's an issue dividing the government of North Carolina. The North Carolina Justice Department is now defending the actions of the state's high court. They are backed by President Joe Biden's administration. David Thompson is a lawyer for the other side, the state's lawmakers. Your Honor, so our, our position is that checks and balances do apply, but they come from the federal constitution and the panoply of federal laws like the Voting Rights Act and other statutes that are highly protective of voters. So there is a check, there is a balance, and there's also a political 
Uh, so we've got the legal ba uh, check from federal law, and we've got the political uh, check uh, that the founders envisioned of going to Congress. And as I mentioned, this very Congress, this House of Representatives, voted to ban partisan gerrymandering in all 50 states. The court heard about three hours of arguments with some of its conservatives, including Samuel Alito and Clarence Thomas, indicating sympathy toward the Republican arguments. The three liberal justices signaled opposition to the Republican arguments. The position of others, including Chief Justice John Roberts, was harder to read, raising the possibility of a ruling less broad than the one sought by the Republican state lawmakers. The eventual decision due by the end of June could apply to 2024 elections, including the U.S. presidential race. There are subtle but tangible signs of trucking activity following the government's calls for truckers to return to work to keep the economy afloat, as it has already been costing U.S. dollars of $2.6 in economic losses in South Korea. The unionized trucker strike is seemingly losing momentum. Signs of that, the recovery in shipment levels. At the country's biggest harbor in Busan, the volume of container shipments is now at pre-strike levels. The logistic hub in the greater Seoul area, Uwang Inland Container Depot, is seeing 20 personal vehicles now in full operation, up from single digits earlier in the strike. Shipments of steel have recovered to 50 percent of the usual levels. The capital area and the Chungcheong and Gangwon regions are still seeing some gas stations run of fuel, but the shortages are not spreading further. The cement sector was the first to witness rebounding shipments now at 90 percent of the usual levels. This comes as cement truckers for a survey government's return to work order invoked last Tuesday are partially returning to work. More expected to return as the government ramps up pressure, conducting unsigned inspections, which will lead to penalties if the truckers refuse to comply. However, this only comes after massive economic damage due to the two weeks of strike by truckers, calling for a permanent adoption of a minimum wage system that calculates their pay based on operating costs. The strike so far has resulted in a combined $2.6 billion of economic loss in the steel, oil and petrochemicals industries. To prevent further damage, the land minister Won Yuryong hinted at invoking return to work orders for truckers and industries other than the cement industry. Members of the truckers' union are blocking the gates of cement factories, trying to prevent shipments. Also in support of the strike in truckers, construction workers associated with an umbrella union are joining the strike. The government has vowed police protection for those refusing to take part in the strike. Apple is being sued by two women who says air tags were used to stalk them. The small trackers are designed to be placed on wallets or keys to prevent them from being lost. However, earlier this year, several women had found unwanted air tags tracking them. Apple, however, is yet to address any of the allegations. Tonight, two women suing Apple over its controversial AirTag devices, saying in the suit they fear for their safety, adding that their stalkers use AirTags to track, harass and threaten them. <coughs> Arguing the AirTag design is defective because it doesn't perform as safely as an ordinary consumer would have expected it to. The class action lawsuit says plaintiff Lauren Hughes' ex-boyfriend started stalking her last year, leaving threatening voicemails and notes at her door. Scared, she moved out of her apartment. The lawsuit says she found an air tag lodged in the well of her tire and says police told her they could only read the stalker a cease and desist. The plaintiffs aren't alone in their concerns. I was being informed that there has been an air tag that has been following me since 5 o'clock. Kimberly's group told Top Story she got an air tag alert in January. My phone told me that there had been an air tag that had been following me. But she couldn't find it and said police wouldn't take a report. Uh, it's just scary. Check your belongings, check your surroundings. It was the scariest, scariest moment ever. Earlier this year, model Brooks Nader made this Instagram post saying she believes someone put an air tag into her jacket at a restaurant bar. When reached out for comment, Apple directed us to a statement released in February that said in part, we condemn in the strongest possible terms any malicious use of our products. The company also said it made AirTag updates, including privacy warnings, unwanted tracking alerts, and the ability to locate an AirTag if there is unwanted tracking.
Welcome back to World News tonight and for more news let's take you around the world in a minute. FIFA's president Infantino said in an appearance on FIFA's official channel that the Qatar 2022 World Cup group stages were the best ever and that the remainder of the World Cup is very promising. Beijing residents said that they were ready to battle COVID at home a day after China dropped key parts of its tough zero COVID regime. A team that Donald Trump hired to search for White House documents found at least two classified records at the former president's Florida home. They found the documents in a storage room at his Palm Beach home, one of the four properties searched. As the Artemis 1 mission prepares to return to Earth, the last mission to the moon Apollo 17 marks 50 years. The global supply of iPhones is expected to be cut by an additional 3 million units this month. Supply was already cut by 6 million in November. Apple is expected to ship around 75.5 million iPhones, down from its original forecast of 85 million in the fourth quarter. A Guatemalan court sentenced both former President Otto Perez and his vice president to 16 years in prison, each in a graft case years after explosive corruption revelations forced the two out of the office early and into prison. And that is all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Now, Christmas can never come too soon for Johan Wanner. We are leaving you tonight with the world's biggest purveyor of handmade Christmas decorations whose shop in the Swiss city of Basel attracts shoppers from around the world. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.